The next item of business is a debate on motion 16702 in the name of Miles Briggs on looking after those who look after us. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to open today's debate by paying tribute to all those who work in our Scottish NHS and social care services. I know, I know every MSP across the chamber from whatever part of Scotland they represent will have seen at first hand the dedication and commitment of our NHS staff in providing each and every one of us and our families with the care that we need in good times and in bad. Any organisation at its heart is its people and the NHS is no different. Deputy Presiding Officer, sometimes in politics there are cases which make you stop and think about how we need to collectively do something to bring about a change. And perhaps one of the most shocking and tragic cases which has stayed with me during my time as Conservative Health Spokesman is that of 23-year-old junior doctor Lauren Connolly. Lauren was killed after her car veered off the M8 motorway as she drove home from a 12-hour night shift at Inverclyde Royal Hospital in Greenock. Dr Connolly from East Kilbride had just been working seven weeks in her medical training at that time. It tragically highlighted the fears over long working hours and fatigue faced by so many who work in our NHS, with staff office, of, often fr frequently working exhausting 100-hour weeks and shift patterns of 12 consecutive days. Now, I want to pay tribute to Lauren's father, Brian Connolly, who has since the tragic death of his daughter campaigned tirelessly alongside the BMA for stricter limits on working hours. I spoke to Mr Connolly last night. He told me his wish that there would be greater public awareness of the hours which junior doctors work, the tiredness which it causes them, and the consequent risks to themselves and patient care. He would welcome the support of all MSPs across this chamber for his campaign in trying to rectify these long-standing problems and improve the health and safety of junior doctors across our country. Dr. Uh, Mr Connolly is determined that we see uh, the First Minister's 2017 pledge to implement a 48-hour working week delivered, and I hope all parties will agree to attend a cross-party meeting I'm organising to help take that forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, people who work in our NHS are superheroes in many people's eyes, but they are not superhuman. We need to understand the impact that the ongoing NHS workforce crisis, which sees high vacancy rates in nursing, consulting and mental health posts, as well as high absence rates across the health service and the impact this is having on staff and staff morale. As the British Medical Association states, there are simply not enough health professionals working in Scotland's NHS today across all professions. 61% of doctors are working over their allocated hours. The British Dental Association recently warned of 57% of associated dentists looking to retire from general dental practice. One in four GPs practices in Scotland has a vacancy. And Scottish NHS is short of 2,400 nurses and midwives. Presiding officer, after 12 years in charge of our Scottish NHS, SNP ministers need to accept that they have presided over a workforce crisis which is impacting on the well-being of NHS staff today. It's little wonder then that the Royal College of Nursing accused Nicola Sturgeon of a spectacular error of judgment when she cut the number of student nurses whilst health secretary, quadrupling the number of unfilled nursing posts and putting all NHS under unprecedented pressure. Perhaps more concerning, is that the BMA also continues to believe that official figures are continuing to underreport the actual extent of vacancies amongst the consultant workforce. BMA research published last year showed that the actual vacancy rate is likely to be running substantially higher than the official figures. FOI data showed vacancies actually at around double the level recorded by official statistics, a difference of around 375 whole-time equivalent vacancies. This would be enough doctors to potentially staff a large hospital that are missing from our Scottish NHS today. Deputy Presiding Officer, we need to understand the severe pressures that NHS staff are under and how this negatively impacts on their own health and well-being. Retention of staff has to become the number one priority for this government and for the health services we all want to see perform well. And that is why Scottish Conservatives have brought this debate forward today. We need to see our NHS working environments take into account the well-being and needs of those who work in them. That's why Conservatives are today calling on ministers to review NHS and social care staff workplace support services in order to look to improve and promote well-being. 
And we have a few ideas, and I know that other members across these benches will also have these, and perhaps more importantly, groups outside of this parliament as well, to how we can move towards a more holistic approach to the well-being of our NHS staff. One of these is sleep pods and phone charging points for hospitals, where NHS night shift staff can rest before they attempt long journeys home. Free parking for NHS staff. Still today, NHS staff in Dundee, Glasgow, and here in Edinburgh continue to face unacceptable parking charges. Mental health and financial advice support for NHS staff. Salus, based in NHS Lanarkshire, is already offering this to all NHS staff, and it's something I would like to see rolled out across the country. Free health checks at community pharmacies to help provide NHS staff with lots of additional holistic support services from weight management. And a focus, I think, importantly, on NHS staff well-being. NHS board has recently told the Health and Sport Committee how they have a well-being Wednesday. And I think we need to look at how we are actually taking forward this good practice across all our health boards. Parties, as I've said, across this chamber, and maybe more importantly, representative bodies will have ideas how we can achieve this. And I agree and hope we can take that forward. Presiding officer, I have to say I'm somewhat disappointed in the Cabinet Secretary's amendment for today's debate. This debate should and can be about how Parliament can collectively do something to support and improve the working lives of those who work in our health and social care services. When the Cabinet for Secretary first took over as Health Secretary, she said she would take a, an approach to this job with mature reflection. And I don't think the approach taken today in trying to delete um, the mention of a workforce crisis we have across our health service is productive. Uh, very briefly, yes. Sandra White. <coughs> I thank the member for taking intervention. I just wanted to ask the member, you have quoted the BMA at, at quite length. Now, the BMA Scotland GP spoke of the potentially devastating effect that Brexit will have, not just in, the, in our health service, but in medicines also. So do you agree with that? I've, I've been absolutely clear in terms of the impact and the potential challenges of Brexit, but the workforce challenges we face across our NHS didn't start with Brexit. They've had 10 years of SNP government, uh, which has built them up. And SNP ministers and SNP members need to understand that after 12 years of being in charge of our NHS, the SNP has no one else to blame but themselves. Now, I, I welcome the constructive amendment which the Labour Party brought forward, and we'll be supporting that at decision time uh, this evening. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope this is an opportunity for us to focus on our NHS staff and what we can do to make their lives easier. It's time we change the approach taken to look after those who look after us. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Jane Freeman to speak to and move Amendment 16702.3 for six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I start by thanking Miles Briggs for bringing this motion before the Parliament today. I am immensely proud of our health and social care staff. The quality of care and treatment and the compassion and dedication shown by our staff is unparalleled, and we thank each and every one of them. Whatever their role, they contribute directly to our nation's health and well-being and to our society. Of course, I recognise the pressure there is from increasing demand on health and care services. The reasons for this are well rehearsed. Demographic challenges, increasingly complex care needs, advances in the care and treatment services we're able to offer. And I recognise that those pressures are felt by our staff. That is why we have acted and will continue to act to support our workforce, increasing training numbers in our nursing and midwifery places, our medical undergraduates, our medical postgraduate programme and in the AHI uh, pathways, promoting training pathways, supporting board recruitment and retention, promoting staff health and well-being and increasing the employee voice. Because delivering sustainable services is not simply about supporting recruitment and retention. The health and well-being of our workforce is of fundamental importance and that is why I'm happy to support the amendment Monica Lennon has brought forward today. We must keep listening to our staff and learning from their experience and so I also welcome and happy to take forward the review of support that has been proposed by Mr Briggs in his motion. Presiding officer, there is though a threat to our work to support our health and care services that cannot be ignored and that threat is Brexit and while I accept that, uh, that some of the challenges we face uh, did not start by Brexit. We have had three years of waiting to see what will happen with Brexit, and we still don't know the answer to that. Since the inception of our health service, 
our health and care services have benefited from inward mi migration. They have benefited too from our healthcare professionals working elsewhere and bringing that experience and knowledge back home to apply here. Free movement is vital for us to continue to attract dedicated professionals to help deliver these services. And it is simply wrong that our EU health and social care staff should no longer feel welcome. And it is absolutely devastating that skilled colleagues who have built their lives here in Scotland should be planning to leave as a result. We will continue to advocate on their behalf and we will continue to argue for a tailored immigration policy that meets Scotland's needs and reflects our values. We are taking comprehensive action, presiding officer, to support increasing medical, nursing and midwifery trainees through the system, including bespoke support for speciality medical training and midwifery to promote uh, both rural training and recruitment. We're maintaining free tuition fees and increasing the nursing and midwifery student birthday to 8,100 this year, 10,000 pounds to 2020, a non-means tested bursary, but scrapped in England by the UK government. And for the seventh successive year, we have increased the number of student midwifery and nursing places. We've provided funding for adult social care workers to be paid the real living wage, benefiting up to 40,000 care workers. Yes, I will. Jackie Bailey. Cabinet Secretary, who helpfully met with me recently to discuss payment of the living wage to overnight care workers. Despite local authorities having the resources to do so, some of them have not passed this on in full, particularly for those employed in the third sector. Can I ask her what progress is being made to ensure that payment starts at the very beginning of this new financial year? Jean I'm, Freeman. I'm grateful to Ms Bailey for raising this. She's long uh, championed this, as I do. The intention to support 24-hour care wherever it is needed is a really important one, and I know we both share that. I met with uh, COSLA yesterday to look specifically at the information we have so far on where this is not being applied and to determine what further action we can take. I'm not yet clear of exactly all the local authorities that are not yet applying this. Some of the data is not yet complete, but as soon as we know that, then between uh, COSLA and ourselves, we will act with those individual authorities and I'll uh, ensure Ms Bailey and others are kept up to date. Our NHS staffing levels are at a new record high, up by over 13,000 whole-time equivalent staff under this government. And to support local recruitment efforts, we have provided record levels of investment with resource and capital expenditure exceeding 14 billion for the first time this year. Members will be well aware that to facilitate workforce and workload planning, we've introduced the Health and Care Staffing Bill, the first multidisciplinary workload and workforce planning legislation in the UK. The bill recognises the fundamentally multidisciplinary nature of health and social care services. It's an important piece of legislation, important for our workforce planning and important for our staff. And I look forward to continuing to work with members across the chamber to make sure we get it right for the whole system of health and social care. Presiding officer, it is absolutely the case that the care, compassion and support we ask our health and social care staff to give, to give to those who need them is care, compassion and support they should receive themselves. I do not believe we can have one without the other. We have across our health boards a number of initiatives looking at the well-being and the mental health support for our staff, but the challenges remain, and I am always open to good constructive ideas that we can try to introduce to improve that approach. And we'll meet, in fact, the BMA later today uh, to discuss further with them the work we're undertaking in, with respect to junior doctors. I remain absolutely committed to high quality, sustainable health and social care. At the heart of that is a healthy and cared for workforce. We're working hard to deliver on it, but there is more for us to do. I look forward to the debate and move the amendment in my name. I now call Monica Lennon to speak to and move amendment 16702.1. No more than five minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Looking after those who look after us is the title of this debate. And I hope today's debate reminds all of us that we should never take our health and social care staff for granted. So I'm grateful to Miles Briggs for securing this debate and to the BMA, the RCN and Enable for their helpful briefings. 
And can I associate the Scottish Labour benches with Miles Briggs' remarks about Dr Lauren Conley, who will be sadly missed by her family and her colleagues. Lauren was from East Kilbrides in the region I represent and uh, I pay tribute to Lauren's father and the family who continue to, to campaign. Um, eight years on uh, since Lauren died, the latest GMC survey found that nearly one in every four UK doctors in training say they are burnt out because of their work. A recent BMA survey found that 91% of doctors are working more than their allotted hours. We know that this problem is not isolated to doctors, but extends to all staff affected by the NHS's workforce crisis. And social care staff are also at risk. The social care sector, as we know, is fragile, and staff often experience poor working conditions, sometimes on zero-hour contracts, low pay, and facing demanding shift patterns. But health and social care staff are being stretched to their limits, working more than their contracted hours at times, and staff that I speak to feel like they are always on call. So ahead of the debate, I was also keen to look at what support is available to staff. And I was interested to hear from Unison that some NHS workplaces have implemented staff wellbeing initiatives, such as lunchtime yoga, something we perhaps all could benefit from. And I note the Scottish Conservatives have called for provision for sleep facilities so that staff can catch up, catch up on much needed sleep before driving home, for example. I think these are all ideas that are worth exploring and any measure which will protect staff and promote health and safety in the workplace needs to be encouraged. But on these benches, we are concerned at the working conditions that allow staff to become so exhausted and stressed in the first place. And until the Scottish Government accepts that there is a workforce crisis, they will never truly address the real systemic problems our health and social care services face. Research by Scottish Labour found that between 2015-16 and 2017-18, there were one million days of NHS staff absence caused by stress. And today I attended the an annual review of NHS Lanarkshire where I raised my concerns about staff wellbeing there because in Lanarkshire staff absences and vacancy rates are above the national average. So whilst any measures to support staff are absolutely welcome, we need to ensure that the focus remains on the root causes of poor staff wellbeing, such as too much work and not enough staff. Research from the BMA, from the GMC, Unison and others tell us that factors that contribute to stress can also include workplace culture and bullying and harassment. If our health and social care staff are truly valued, this must be reflected in the workplaces. But we have reason to be concerned that some workplaces are not the supportive environments we expect them to be. This year alone, we have heard worrying cases about staff bullying, concerns about whistleblowing and how it's dealt with. And it's too important to shy away from these issues. Um, I acknowledge that the Health Secretary has said she will appoint whistleblowing champions to every health board. This must happen as a matter of urgency because every day that goes by where staff do not feel able to report their serious concerns, we have more staff feeling demoralised and of course patient safety can be at risk. I think the ongoing issues at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital show how patient safety can be compromised when staff concerns about infection control, about um, estates and cleanliness are not acted upon. So we can support the Conservative motion today because I think it gives all of us an opportunity to show our appreciation and concern for health and safety of staff. But we would suggest that more extensive action is required to tackle the root causes. And that's why I'm pleased to hear from the Cabinet Secretary and from Miles Briggs that they can support uh, the, the amendment in my name. We have sympathy for much of what the government is saying about the potentially devastating impact of Brexit on health and social care and the EU citizens who are valuable members of our workforce. But a bit concerned about the amendment because it took out um, the line about the workforce crisis and I think we do have to face up to, to those facts today. In conclusion, presiding officer, Scottish Labour will always support our health and social care staff to get the working conditions that they deserve and the work-life balance that they need. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call Alison Johnson. Four minutes, please, Ms Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I too would like to thank all of those who look after all of us. It's clear that workforce pressures are severely impacting the well-being of health and social care workers. That's the message that's coming from those on the front line. 
In May 2017, the Royal College of Nursing launched a survey of nursing and midwifery staff in the UK with over 3,300 responses from Scotland. The findings clearly show the impact that insufficient staffing has on staff well-being. More than half of respondents reported a shortfall in planned numbers of registered nursing staff on their last shift or last day worked, with around two-thirds having worked unplanned extra time. In addition to this, over half of survey respondents said that care was compromised on their last shift. There's a clear correlation between these conditions and poor staff well-being. One respondent stated that when nursing staff are overstretched due to insufficient staffing, they often suffer the consequences personally, not being able to stay hydrated, to eat or use the toilet, impacts on their physical and emotional well-being. So these conditions are so poor that nurses are often unable to have their basic human needs met. Now, I recognise that the Scottish Government has taken positive steps to address workforce pressures, such as the new GP contract, the introduction of the Health and Care, Health and Care Staffing Bill, and the increasing of nursery and midwifery student bursaries next year. However, the workforce won't increase overnight and there's significant cause for concern around staff well-being during this interim period. And there are also significant pressures around the implementation of the new GP contract. Last year, the Royal College of General Practitioners commissioned a survey of its members, which found that 35% of, of those surveyed had spent consultation time explaining to patients why they'd been offered appointments with other healthcare professionals instead of a GP. So this places strain on GPs who have insufficient 10-minute consultations to see patients with increasingly complex health conditions, but it also causes distress to patients. The same survey reported that 60% of respondents were aware of patients who'd become distressed, angry or confused when signposted by medical practice receptionists. So changes to service as a result of the GP contract as welcome as they may be, they must be urgently communicated to Scotland's population to ease the concern of patients and to lessen the strain on practice staff. There are also substantial pressures in the social care sector, where 15% of social care workers work unpaid overtime and 11% are on zero hours contracts. There's a significant disparity between the value of care and the support carers receive. And it's important that professional caring is valued and considered an attractive career. Social care workers do difficult and essential work in people's homes, in care homes, in the communities, but it remains one of the lowest paid sectors, fueling the gender pay gap. Enable Scotland has called for the extension of the Scottish living wage to cover every hour worked by social care staff, including, as Jackie Bailey has highlighted, overnight sleepover support. However, this needs to be properly funded by commissioners, and as we've heard, all aren't doing so. In February, I urged the Scottish Government to put fair work at the heart of Scotland's care sector by adopting in full the recommendations of the Fair Work Convention's review, Fair Work in Scotland's Social Care Sector. That reported that frontline care workers don't feel respected for the work they do. They do by their colleagues, they do by their employers, but they don't feel particularly valued by the Scottish Government or the wider public. We have to change that. Equitable pay is important, but we need to make sure that social care workers feel respected and supported. Presiding officer, there are positive measures that we can take to address staff wellbeing by ensuring workers in all sectors feel valued and are fairly paid. But it's key that when changes are implemented to, to ease workforce pressures, we have to communicate them properly. But we can't have a healthy no, workforce. No, 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 please. Thank you, presiding conclude. officer. I was making the signals. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Alec Cole Hamilton to be followed by Brian Whittle. It has to be four minutes, Mr Cole Hamilton. Thank you, De uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by echoing the thanks that other members have made to the Conservatives for securing time for this debate and echoing the thanks to our workforce who look after us. Um, <laughs> on two occasions, I'm sure many members can tell similar stories to this, but two, on two occasions, primary healthcare workers have represented the bridge between normal life and oblivion for my family. And that's in, in the first case when my eldest son was born and wasn't breathing, they revived him after huge complications in theatre. Uh, and then secondly, very much more recently with my four-year-old daughter Darcy, when a whole team of clinicians stayed behind when their shift had ended uh, to operate on her to extract a coin that she had swallowed. I owe them the lives of my children. And I'm sure I'm not alone 
in this chamber of people who have similar uh, personal stories to tell. The, the NHS is unique in this place, isn't it? I mean, it's, um, it's something that attracts both great love, but at times great derision as well. And I think it's important to separate, though, and to put on record that as an opposition politician, and I speak for all opposition politicians, I'm sure that while we sometimes attack government policy and sometimes the governance of our health boards, we never, ever attack the work of our frontline staff. They are uh, heroes of our country. Um, the first thing I'd like to say in tribute to them is that, as many have already, that there just aren't enough of them. There, aren't, there is a workforce crisis. It is wrong of the government to try and amend the Conservative motion to delete those words today. And we have seen, since I was elected, many of my colleagues on these benches were elected in 2016, warning lights across the, uh, the dashboard of workforce planning in a range of disciplines. Uh, but for me and my party, no more is that more profound than in the than in the area of mental health. We already know about the waiting list that children and young people face in terms uh, of waiting for adequate mental health. Uh, but also, um, right across mental health at all ages, that is a source of great importance, and I'll tell you why. Because, for example, we were going to recruit 800 mental health workers. In the two years since that policy was announced, we've only recruited 106. Put that in context, when one in four appointments are made with a general practitioner because of an underlying mental health complaint, then no wonder that our GP morale is rock bottom, that they're having to deal with things that actually that would be better solved by mental health practitioners. So I asked the government to respond to the concerns that we have about the short uptake or the slow uptake of those positions. Morale is so important, and that feeds into morale as well. But there are many factors which are lowering staff morale in our frontline NHS, whether that's having to send people a 12-week waiting time guarantee letter that they know they have no hope of meeting, in closing wards to elective surgery because there are no receiving beds in the wider hospital uh, to receive inpatients because of delayed discharge. I actually had a, a senior neurosurgeon come to my constituency surgery to talk about how low the morale was in his department because of repeated closures of his ward due to the lack of inpatient beds. And we've also heard a thing or two about safety, and, um, and Alison Johnson is absolutely right to cite the concerns of frontline nurses who say that patient care was compromised on the last shift that they did. But it's not just patient care. We need to recognise that staff need to be kept safe as well, and that's why we've sought amendments in the Safe Staffing Bill to recognise the, the preeminence and importance of uh, safety in our staff. I think also our approach to whistleblowing matters hugely because we need our staff to understand that firstly they are being listened to, they are being believed, that they will see corrective action and culture change. And that is not a universally uh, accepted or re well regarded service across our NHS. You can see that and the fact that sometimes clinicians will phone national newspapers about a problem before they phone the national whistleblowing helpline, so such is the concern. I just want to close by th saying we, we also have to thank our social care workforce and those unpaid carers looking after their loved ones, but we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Time is very tight in these short debates. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I am uh, delighted to get the opportunity to speak in this debate. Um, but may I refer members to my register of interest, and I have a close family member who is an NHS uh, healthcare professional. As the Chamber knows, my big passion lies in the preventable health agenda and that escalating cost uh, of treatment of preventable conditions to the NHS is unsustainable. My view is that we're not managing the sustainability of the NHS, rather we're managing its demise. And we know the conditions we're talking about, the COPD, obesity and preventable cancers, some MSK conditions, mental health, stroke and so on. So if we are to maintain the long-term future of our most precious public service free at the point of delivery, it is crucial that policy tackles this issue. In developing a strategy, we must ensure we have a delivery mechanism and key to this delivery will be our NHS staff. And I wrote a paper last year about changing Scotland's relationship with food, drink and physical activity. And the very first action point noted that in asking our healthcare professionals to look after us and deliver a healthier wellbeing message, we have to look after the health of our healthcare professionals first. It has to be the first step. In so many cases, our healthcare professionals work in an environment that leads them to be more unhealthy than the people they are delivering the healthcare message to. So we need an environment where they're able to look after their own health and well-being, where they can adopt an active, healthy lifestyle of their own, 
before they're asking uh, and recommending uh, that to others. And that should be the foundation of any strategy. Some potential interventions are, on the face of it, uh, reasonably straightforward. I think ensuring every staff member has access to a hot meal during their shift and an adequate time, uh, break time to eat it. Some hospitals do not have staff rooms that allow a fridge or a microwave, leaving the night shift with the only option being a vending machine. Utilising any on-site facilities like gym equipment in the physio department with instruction to do so, to Monica Lennon's point about, take, uh, about yoga classes, and giving them time uh, allocated to do so is another example. If we're going to ask our healthcare professionals to deliver a service that has a focus on getting the population to be more physically active and to be more nutritionally aware, it is obvious we need to afford them the very same opportunities. Without this step, the subsequent steps become problematic. The quality of care in this environment, not to mention the health of our healthcare professionals, including a reduction in absenteeism for both physical and mental health issues, could be greatly enhanced. We believe this would allow the opportunity for healthcare professionals to deliver the kind of preventative care and acute care they desire to do so. As an example, the cardiac physiotherapy department at Crosshouse Hospital at the NHS Ayrshire and Arm have been running an extended community rehabilitation program that will not only helps chest, heart and stroke sufferers, but also welcomes people with other conditions such as obesity, mental skeletal sufferers and so on. The comorbidity exercise and education classes have been very successful in not only reducing further readmissions to hospital or doctor's appointments, they have been very instrumental in increasing the quality of life for those suffering with these conditions. These are innovative and creative solutions our healthcare professionals can come up with if they're given the support, room and encouragement to apply their knowledge. It's therefore disappointment to read the, the amendments by the Cabinet Secretary who seems to toe the SNP line of trying to blame Brexit for everything. There are staff shortages and there, will be lo and there were there long before Brexit. I wonder if she can consider the impact of Nicola Sturgeon cutting nurse and midwifery places in 2012 and the current staffing rates poor workforce planning. There are multiple Scottish applications for every midwife uh, training place or nurse place or doctors at medical schools or physiotherapists and so on. The reason there is a short shortage, especially among Scottish applications, is because the Scottish Government have capped the places. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, in, I'm at the end of my The member's got please. six seconds. Deputy President, Officer, in conclusion, this is a serious debate. It is a health debate that is long overdue in this chamber, but has been systematically avoided in government debating time. Our NHS staff are the main driver to deliver a healthier Scotland. It is time we looked after their health. Thank you very much. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate to highlight the work that both the Scottish Government as well as health boards across Scotland are carrying out to ensure appropriate levels of staffing in our NHS. And I'd like to start by saying that I do recognise that across NHS boards in Scotland there are challenges with the recruitment of health professionals, particularly GPs. And I've just read a report or heard an announcement that uh, there's 100,000 employees short in England and 40,000 nurses short in England. So if we are going to try and recruit to Scotland, we'll not be getting them from England, we'll have to get them from somewhere like uh, Europe and that is going to be a challenge as well. So it is... Actually, I won't take an intervention because we didn't have a lot of time. So we can't fix the health staffing issues um, immediately but there are things that are being implemented by the Scottish Government to support this and one project that the Scottish Government has implemented which aims to support recruitment of GPs to rural areas across Scotland is the Scottish Graduate Entry to Medicine programme. ScotGem is a partnership between St Andrews and Dundee University and NHS Scotland and it's a course orientated towards the current NHS Scotland workforce requirements, particularly in remote and rural areas and general practice and other medical specialties. While Scott GM graduates will be entitled to enter any branch, the course and selection of students are designed to attract those interested in a career in a rural area. And in, in an area of the south of Scotland, there's five GP practices across the Fries and Galloway, which are set to take part in the pilot, and I look forward to seeing its outcomes. Presiding officer, I know that the Scottish Government is committed to supporting our highly skilled health and social care workforce to deliver a resilient, efficient and highly quality, high quality health care service, which is world renowned. It's already world renowned. And as a member of the Health and Sport Committee, 
I have been involved in the safe staffing legislation as we take this bill forward. And the first multidisciplinary workforce and workload planning legislation in the UK is now approaching stage three. And the effective application of this legislation will support the wider workforce planning process by enabling a rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making on staffing, which takes account of patients and users and healthcare needs. I'd like to just pick up on a couple of points that, uh, that were made. You know, as an employee of the NHS, prior to coming here, while the SNP government was leading for nine years, mm -hmm. so I was an NHS employee for nine years prior to coming here, I felt I was always positively supported in many ways. It's not the SNP's fault that there's issues around staffing and challenges. There are many issues that contribute to that. The required evolution of processes to support all staff takes time. And I absolutely agree that Miles Briggs has highlighted various ideas and options for supporting staff. And Monica Lennon has brought this up too. I would like to have expanded on this further, but time won't really allow. But uh, at the end of Miles Briggs' motion, it talks about uh, a review and of promoting well-being and looking after those uh, people in Scotland, so the people who are caring for us, and especially me when I have been in hospital myself related to my type 1 diabetes. But uh, the goal for us is to help support people while in work and prevent sickness and absence. NHS and Freeson Galloway have in introduced this as well, mm -hmm. so I would encourage the government to review current practices across health boards because I think we need to make sure that the people across NHS Scotland are supported because they are working really hard. Thank you very much. I call Lewis MacDonald, be followed by Sandra White. Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. Last year we rightly celebrated 70 years of the NHS. This year we need to look forward as well and consider what kind of health services we want and expect for the next generation. Some things are bound to change. People living longer means new challenges for health and care as well as a different demographic balance. New technologies are part of the way forward. This morning's Press and Journal highlighted the potential for GP consultations going online at Count as well as in Aberdeen where internet speeds of one gigabyte per second will provide fast and secure connections. But the same newspaper also highlighted the decline in the number of GP practices in Grampian, down by more than 10% in the last 10 years. GP practice numbers have also fallen in many other areas, from Lanarkshire to Orkney and the Western Isles. The future delivery of care in communities will require not just enough GPs, but also a whole range of other healthcare professionals from pharmacists and physician associates to occupational therapists and advanced nurse practitioners. So this is a good time to consider what primary care will look like in the next 30 years and what staff and skills it will need and what support those staff will require. The Health and Sports Committee, of course, is doing just that. And I hope that many of all our constituents listening to this debate will take the opportunity to go to the Scottish Parliament website and tell the committee their views. Hospital care also faces real challenges right now, and many of those are also fundamentally about staff. One thing that has changed very little since the inception of the National Health Service is how far we depend on the dedication and commitment of healthcare staff. Monica Lennon and others mentioned issues raised uh, by staff organisations like the BMA and the RCN, and they tell very similar tales. Nurses in Scotland and across the NHS have described how often they have to cope with inadequate staffing levels, how often they have to do more than their planned shift in order to ensure patients receive the care they need. Doctors talk about going the extra mile to cover for ill or absent colleagues or long-term vacancies, keeping the NHS afloat, but often feeling that they get little thanks for doing so. All of that is bound to affect the quality of care. It also risks the kind of reputational damage that makes recruiting the next generation of healthcare professionals to the NHS all the harder. Those are challenges which must be faced, whatever we call them, and addressed uh, sooner rather than later, because otherwise we risk the very goodwill and commitment that is so important uh, to the NHS from the people who work for it. We also need to acknowledge today the issues facing the social care workforce. The Health and Care Staffing Bill, which 
Emma Harper mentioned, does acknowledge the need for parity between health and social care as part of the process of health and care integration. When it comes to pay and support for staff, though, as we have heard, social care is still the poor relation of the NHS. <clears throat> the Joseph Rowntree Foundation say that 15% of the social care workforce live in poverty. Enable described that as Scotland's most vulnerable people being cared for by Scotland's most vulnerable workforce. And that clearly has to change. So when we look to the future, we have to think about how to close the gap between the NHS and social care at the same time as addressing the staffing challenges in the NHS itself. We can only create the high quality integrated health and care sector, which we all want and need, if we start by supporting those who work there now and in the future and make the sector an attractive place to work for the next generation too. Thank you very much. I call Sandra White to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms. White, uh, Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, can I just start by thanking Miles Briggs for bringing uh, this uh, debate forward? I think credit is always due, credit is due, and I'm happy to, to see that, as I think everyone in this chamber is also. And can I also mention the fact that that's why the SNP government, the SNP government, is committed to supporting a highly skilled health and social care workforce. And we want to deliver a resilient, efficient, high quality healthcare service. And I must say, as far as I can see, going about uh, the various areas in my constituency, that is recognised amongst being the best in the world, the Scottish healthcare. is recognised being one of the best in the world. And we talk about um, staff morale. I often ask myself, and I'm going to ask the opposition parties too, particularly Miles Briggs, when you're talk constantly talking about crisis, crisis in the health service, crisis in the NHS, do you not think that has something to do with the morale as well of people who work in the health service? And I certainly speak to them and have been for a while now. And that word crisis, they feel as though you're using this as a political football. And I just leave it there. And you speak, you, no, I'm sorry, I don't have time. And you speak to the healthcare professionals out there. And you listen to the BMA and others also. And basically, that is what they say. No, I don't have time. Sorry, Miles, I might come back in and again. And you mentioned the fact about staffing. And yeah, we agree, but we're looking at staffing. We're looking at the staffing in the NHS. And it was said by the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, earlier on, the staffing level now is 13,600 more. It's actually a record level. It's went up by 10.7% an increase. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So I think it's time we did look at some of the positive issues. I'm not saying we're perfect, no, but I think it's about time we looked at some of the positive issues there. And I do want to turn to Brexit. I think I have to turn to Brexit. Before I do turn to Brexit, we mentioned in Monica Lennon's uh, motion, mentions this fact. But I think we also should be acknowledging that the Health and Social Care Staff Experience Report found that 79% of NHS staff feel they're being treated with dignity and respect. So I think we have to look at that also, uh, and I think that's only fair. But if I turn to the Brexit situation, I'm sorry, Maureen, I've only got two minutes, not even that. Uh, if I want to turn to the Brexit situation, I've already mentioned the BMA and the comments that the BMA said, and absolutely quite rightly too. But we've also got the view of 24 health professionals in Scotland who wrote an open letter to the UK government. And they said, as doctors, nurses and healthcare professionals from Scotland, we see the damage Brexit is already inflicting on our treasured national health service. Make no mistake about it. Brexit is costing us lives. That's not my quote, that is their quote. So let's look at what other people are saying in regards to Brexit. And let's look at what the EU citizens make a fantastically vital contribution to our economy. They drive the population growth, they work in all the sectors, and the vast majority of EU citizens in Scotland are of working age, 84% and 76.8% of them are in employment. And because of what's happening with your government, the Tories in Westminster, we will lose these people. And these, no, I can't, John, sorry. We will lose these people. And these people are already leaving because they're absolutely terrified they will not be able to stay in this country. Now, Lewis McDonald's contribution, I, I found, was very interesting. But if you're quiet, you might hear some interesting facts and figures. 
I find Lewis MacDonald's contribution very interesting. He talks about care homes, care staff, and that is absolutely true. We took evidence, as Miles Briggs knows full well, on the health committee, and that was what was said. These people are leaving and they're frightened, and that's all down to you. So please don't talk about just a crisis. You take responsibility for what your government is doing in Westminster to the health service here in Scotland. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. And can I remind members to use full names even when in full flow? Uh, I call Annie Wells to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr McGregor is the last speaker in the open debate. Annie Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I first of all want to put on record my personal thanks to NHS and social care staff who work so hard to care for us. And I can think of at least a handful of individuals who have helped my family so much during difficult times. And it's not just the act itself of providing health care and all the years of studying and hard work that go into that, but the little acts of kindness that we can all probably think of that have touched us some way or at some point in our lives. That's why I hope we can all get behind this motion. People go into health and social care, people who go into health and social care do so because they care about people. And for that reason alone, we should do all we can to care for them. The context of this is important. With our NHS facing numerous staffing related problems, the NHS workforce in Scotland is getting older with the proportion of staff age 50 and over increasing from 29% to 39% in the last 10 years alone. Absence rates due to sickness are at the highest level for a decade, in part due to rising workloads. And we're ex experiencing a recruitment crisis. Just as examples, one in four GP practices currently have a vacancy in Scotland. Hospitals are short of nearly 2,500 nurses and midwives. And 5.5% of CAMS posts are vacant. It's no wonder then that staff are struggling. Even without considering the factors the government has control over, the jobs themselves are extremely demanding, both physically and mentally. And we've heard some extremely sad stories already today, and unfortunately they're not that difficult to find. As we've heard, not only are people's lives put in danger because of extreme fatigue, as we saw with the young medic Lauren Connolly, who died while driving home last year after a night shift, but these roles take an extreme toll on people's mental health. Statistics last year revealed that the number of staff absent due to stress, depression and anxiety rose by nearly 18% between 2015-16 and 2017-18. We are advocating today, what we're advocating today is the creation of a working environment that provides holistic care and support to all NHS and social care staff. These are simple measures that would make a real difference as we've already had parking, for example, is a real issue for many NHS staff, especially in Glasgow. In recent days, we've heard more about the ongoing saga of parking at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, where it's been reported in the past that nurses have slept in their cars just to get a space. Late last year, nurses at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary launched a petition against the £20 charges being levelled at them for the privilege just to park at their work. Any future Scottish Conservative government would launch a more widespread review of parking across all hospitals for staff, patients and visitors. We wish to see sleep pods in hospitals for shift staff to rest after their shifts, as well as health checks at the local community pharmacies, which will include blood pressure checks and weight management programmes, as well as the option of free flu, flu jabs. Mental health support too is vital which is why we want to see every health board have an inbuilt facility where staff can get any necessary mental health support as well as financial advice. These are again simple measures that could lay the foundations of a more supportive working environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deputy President Officer, the most valuable resource in our NHS is its people. Yeah. Therefore, it's only right that the workplace services are improved to promote the well-being of its staff. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Conservatives today are calling for basic measures that will make a real difference to people's working lives. Only then can we say that we are truly looking after those that look after us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call full to Big Bregger and then we move to op uh, closing speeches. Can say opening speeches? That have shocked everybody. Full to McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'd also like to thank the Conservatives and Miles Briggs for bringing this uh, motion to the chamber. And I would agree that uh, the principle that our NHS and social care workers are one of our most indispensable resources in this country, and they can say, face considerable pressure in their careers and on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And, and the SNP government um, can certainly be seen to be backing and strengthening their workforce so that they can deliver the efficient and high quality service that they do constantly day in and day out. And I think it's only proper that as the constituency MSP for Coat Bridge and Christen that I uh, pay tribute to, to the workers across uh, across my constituency in the health service and social care services, whether it's at the, the Monklands Hospital, the health centres, the day services and many, many more. And I want to pay a particular tribute to TU workers and I'm not sure why the Conservative benches uh, are so keen to bring forward this motion about the impact of health and workers but are resistant to the impact on EU workers who are going through a torrid time just now and it is really impacting on their health and they're also having to work under such circumstances. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned, the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill is the first multidisciplinary workload and workforce planning legislation in the UK, showing that the SNP really are taking the lead in supporting our healthcare professionals and using the, the groundbreaking evidence-based approach to nursing and midwifery workload and workload planning, the Health and Care Staffing Bill will provide assurance for staff and service users that appropriate staffing is in place irrespective of health or care setting. And this will allow, um, apologies for that. And this, mm, apologies. I've, I've lost my place. <laughs> oh. We didn't notice. Oh, okay. So, presiding officer, I, I, I do want to focus the rest of my remarks. I apologise for that. I do want to focus the rest of my remarks on a local issue in my constituency. Uh, I was shocked and astounded to recently learn that Lanarkshire's Joint Integrated Board Meeting voting on a recommendation to close the dementia day services at East Stewart Gardens in Coat Dyke. This is a fantastic local unit providing an invaluable and critical service to many vulnerable patients across my constituency. And for the context, the, the day service doesn't just cater to those individuals and families living with dementia, but I know that even a local nursery attend there weekly to build relationships uh, and bond between the generations and they find this a very valuable experience. But probably most concerning and relevant to today's debate, I learned that the staff, patients and their families we were only told of the proposal to close the service days before the decision was due to be made. And this has caused considerable distress for all concerned. As soon as I found out about it, I wrote to the board urging them to reject the decision to close the centre and to undertake a full equalities impact assessment before making any further recommendations. These decisions cannot be taken lightly, and it's not just for the service users, but also for staff to be notified only days before. It's just not acceptable. And that mu must have had an absolutely massive impact on uh, on their health um, so presiding officer I, I can see that i can see that i'm in, in my last minute and obviously i, I jungled my, my my speech earlier but the, the the board went ahead and made that decision despite representation against it. and i have to give credit where credit's due the conservative party resisted it as did the smp but the local labor party uh, seen it through and i don't think that that's acceptable not for the notice that was given and the stress that that's placed on staff members uh, who work there and for no uh, engagement with unions or with uh, with msps or with councillors uh, uh, at all uh, is just totally not acceptable and fits in exactly with this motion so to conclude presiding officer i do welcome this motion being brought forward but i think as sandra white said we all must work together to deliver the best health care services there is further work for the scottish government to do i know that the the, the cabinet secretary will will We'll, we'll summarise that and, and I've outlined some of the work that has been done. But funding must be prioritised from the UK government too. And at a local authority level, councillors of all parties must put local politics to one side. And that way, we can get the best services that our nations deserve. Thank Thanks you. Uh, closing speeches, I call Monica Leonard. Close for Labour. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Fulton McGregor is always a, a hard act to follow, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try my best. Um, I think today it's been, a, it's been a short debate, but I think it has been a useful debate. We've had members reflect on how important the NHS has been to, to them and their family. And I'm glad to hear that, that Darcy, Alex Cole Hamilton's young daughter, is, is doing well. And she got us all very worried. We all followed that very closely on social media. So we, we all have in common and are out of need. We all need to pick up that phone and phone for an ambulance or get to the doctors. And it reminds us all that, that we're all actually human beings. However, I think what almost unites the, the Parliament is um, the, the reality that we do have a workforce crisis. There has been a failure to, to plan effectively for the, the needs of, of the, the workforce. And Lewis MacDonald 
as, as a Labour colleague, but I think actually channeling his, his convener hat was, was rightly looking to, to the future, thinking about the challenges, um, the, the next generation in terms of workforce, looking at the role of technology, and also uh, very uh, nicely plugging the Health and Sport Committee survey, which is, is ongoing. I believe the closing date is the 30th of April. And I hope that all of us will encourage our constituents to take part and have their voice heard. Because we know when people feel that they're not being listened to, whether that's patients, whether that's people requiring social care, or indeed workforce, if people don't feel they're being listened to, they don't feel valued. And today, as I said, I was at NHS Lanarkshire for the annual review, and there was a mixture of that. People who genuinely are appreciative and recognise the great work and some of the, the innovation that's underway, but also a frustration that health and social care integration isn't happening quickly enough. People are not knitting together. And the Cabinet Secretary will hear me often talk about resourcing and my concerns about underinvestment across the spectrum of health and social care. But it's not always about the money, it's not all about that. And that's why we need to make sure that we have the right culture. We need strong leadership at the top in all of our health boards and all of our health and social care partnerships. Because sometimes we find that people are raising issues, people do have good ideas, we have the best staff in the world, but people feel sometimes that they're not being listened to. And also when I speak to um, colleagues in Unison, for example, their concern is that lots of people seem to get up the ladder in the NHS and and, and, and doing quite well, but the, the training and development is not always keeping up with that, and people feel that sometimes there is poor management. I, I know these are all issues that the Cabinet Secretary will, will recognise, not just from our time leading a health board or sharing a health board, but now as the Cabinet Secretary. I think there are points where we can all work together, and we have to continue to do that, because all of this is far too important. So for the, for the point that I've made about the fact that there is a workforce crisis, I think we're doing the people of Scotland and our health and care staff a disservice if we, if we deny that fact. So for that reason, um, we won't support the amendment in the Cabinet Secretary's name. But I think there are shared sentiments across the chamber to be, today. Um, I think, you know, listen to colleagues like Emma Harper, who, again, is a valued member of the Health and Sport Committee. You know, we need people in here um, the fact that we have a mental health minister who was a mental health nurse, these are attributes to this parliament, but we will need to at times step out of our own comfort zone and our maybe party positions to find ways of working together. To go back to the beginning, Miles Briggs highlighted the, the tragedy of, of Dr Lauren Conley. We can't have any more tragedies like that. I don't yet have an answer from the government about what we're going to do to reduce the fact that in those years that I mentioned, there were one million working days lost in the NHS for stress absence alone. Some of that will be outwith of the workplace. We, we get that. People don't come into their work and switch off from their outside life. But these are the big challenges that we face. And I hope after today, looking at what we've agreed uh, in the debate, presiding officer, there's a lot there that we can build on and, and develop for the future. Thank you. I call on Jean Freeman to close the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, five minutes, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, and can I thank uh, all the members who have contributed in the debate, uh, I think it's been uh, a very uh, helpful one and uh, helpful to me to hear uh, some of the propositions that people have put forward. I want to cover some of the points that, that have been raised. Um, Mr Briggs was right to recognise the work uh, of uh, Brian Conley in uh, response to the tragic death of his daughter. And uh, in recognising that, uh, I want to, in passing, also pay tribute to uh, our colleague Linda Fabiani, who has, of course, long championed this issue. I want to just uh, advise members of where we've got to in this work. I will be talking uh, with the BMA uh, shortly about all of this, but so far uh, we've got to a point where no junior doctor is required to work more than seven days in a row. Working seven nights in a row has been abolished, and by August this year, a minimum 46-hour rest period will be implemented, and we are continuing to work with the expert group on the maximum 48 hours working week with no averaging. So we're taking steps uh, in this direction because it is, of course, vitally important. In terms of some of the issues that were also raised, I need to make the point uh, that I know uh, the BMA and others have raised with the UK government, and that is about their recent changes to pensions and the impact that is having in terms of many of our uh, medical workforce, both consultants and GPs. I met a GP this morning uh, at the new Gorbals uh, 
Health Hub who was uh, raising that precisely with me. This is a serious matter and we will continue to press the UK government alongside colleagues in the BMA and others to look at this again because I am certain that there are unintended consequences here and I hope our colleagues in the Conservative benches uh, will support us in doing that. Can I make the, make the point and thank Ms Lennon for raising yet again uh, the point that she makes very uh, often but is quite right to do so and that is a point about culture. Uh, and the importance of culture in our workforce. Why do, why do people uh, enjoy their work? Partly because it's recognised and valued, partly because of how it's paid, but also because of the culture in which they work, where they feel the ideas and concerns and issues that they have to raise are recognised and that there is no negative comeback to them. I will come back to this chamber uh, after the uh, Easter recess to report on the outcome of the independent Sturrock review with respect to NHS Highland. And in that context, I also want to bring members up to date on where we are on the national whistleblowing uh, champion and on uh, those board issues uh, that Ms Lennon quite rightly laid and can, raised. And can I also make the point uh, with respect to Project Lift, which is a values-based uh, uh, leadership programme across our health service, values-based recruitment as an important part of that, which is trying to address some of the issues that you raised in terms of training and support as people uh, take on additional responsibilities. Um, Ms Johnson, of course, uh, made an absolutely important point and one that I will follow up on, which is about the urgent need for communication uh, on the changes that the GP contract will bring to the patient's experience. And now, uh, one year on, we can use some positive examples where we now have uh, GPs able to offer uh, at least 15 minute appointments uh, and also uh, patients feeling that they saw the right person uh, for uh, the, the concern or the medical issue that they had. So I will pursue that. She's also right to talk about the value of social care staff uh, and the, the importance of that being a career. Uh, that's one of the areas of work that we're busy on uh, in terms of looking at how people can continue to work in social care whilst building up some of the skill and education based practical modules in order uh, to pursue their career in social care. Of course, that has to be done in partnership with our local authorities and also with the private and independent sector uh, providers. But all of, all of them, I believe, are well supportive of the approach. We need to work out how much more we can do, not least making absolutely sure that the funding we have passed through local authorities for the uh, real living wage for 24 hours care is actually used for that purpose. And I am determined that we will do that. Let me turn to the point about um, is it a crisis, is it a challenge? Do you know, there are challenges that we face, but my, my point is simply this. Calling it a crisis doesn't take us one step further forward in addressing some of the measures that we have to take. It does not help our staff in the health and social care workforce. I am not dodging, no I can't, I am not dodging the issues that we have to address. I am not dodging the challenge. And Mr Whittle, I did not claim that Brexit was the sole reason for all of this. But what I will not accept is Scottish Conservatives pretending that Brexit has got nothing to do with you and that it's not affecting our health and social care workforce. I did not say that. But what is not no, helpful... No, I'm afraid you must what is, conclude. Must what is conclude. not helpful is for members to choose to use this to score political points, not do the research, find out the facts about what we're doing must and address conclude, this sorry, maturely. Cabinet Thank Secretary you very much. Must conclude. I call Michelle Ballantyne uh, to wind up. Uh, Ms Ballantyne, six minutes, and I warn members, I intend to move swiftly on to the next debate so we don't lose time. Ms Ballantyne. Okay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We call it our NHS. Those are the words we use because every one of us is touched by it at some points in our life. Last year, the NHS celebrated its 70th birthday. In the words of the Ch Scotland's Chief Medical Officer, we are moving into an era of realistic medicine in NHS Scotland, moving away from the current doctor's knows best and culture to shared decision making with their patient and the healthcare professional. A change I welcome. I think it's the right move, but it is a change that will bring challenges to staff. I spent 27 years working in the NHS, first as a nurse and then in management. And I can tell you that in 27 years, we never stopped changing. I doubt very much we'll ever stop changing the NHS, but this does bring challenges. Um, now, the Cabinet Secretary 
argues the word, is it a challenge or is it a crisis? Well, it's always a challenge, but it becomes a crisis when the numbers start to escalate. Absences due to stress increased by nearly 20% over the course of the three years from 2015-16 to 2017-18. Is that not a bit of a crisis? One in four GP practices in Scotland has a vacancy. Is that not a bit of a crisis? There are over 400 vacant consultant posts. Is that not a bit of a crisis? And hospitals are short of 2,400 nurses and midwives at the last data I had. Is that not a bit of a crisis? Now, they're all challenges. They are all challenges, and I will agree with that. But I think we have to use our words carefully. I totally agree with that. But it is a crisis for the staff there. It is a crisis every day when they come to work and there are shortages of staff on the wards. It is a crisis for them when they feel they can't deliver the standards of patient care that they want to deliver. It is a crisis for social care staff when they find themselves with four people on a rota that requires ten. It is a crisis when the only applicants you can get for a social care job is somebody with no experience for a profoundly disabled person. That is a crisis. Now, I don't, I'm not looking to undermine it. I love the NHS, and I, like all the people here who talk about the NHS and the people who work there, of course we all value everybody, of course we acknowledge it. This debate is not about undermining people. It's about saying we need to acknowledge the issues that we face, and we need to acknowledge them together. Now, we can argue about the words, but the reality will stay the same. And actually, the Cabinet Secretary described the problems that the NH faces as well rehearsed. Well, we do need to stop rehearsing them, and we do need to come together to address them. You listed the improvements you're taking forward, and we welcome those. I do, I acknowledge that a lot of them are good things that need to go forward. But you also indicated that during it several times that you will listen and reflect. I hope you will, because recently when I've been talking to NH staff, what I'm finding is that senior professionals in the NHS Scotland are increasingly reluctant to speak out about their thoughts and experiences, because when they do, they are taken aside. That is not the kind of atmosphere we need to work in. People need to be free to write and talk constructively about what's going on around them. And a number of members, Monica Lennon, Alex Cole Hamilton, also raised this issue and asked you to bring forward your appointment of whistleblowing champions. Because this isn't just about people low down in the NHS who are finding it difficult with the management structure. This is also senior people who have things to say and don't feel able to say it. So we must, must start to listen and work together on it. Miles obviously talk, Miles, uh, Briggs talked in his opening about the impact that it has when health staff are stressed, when they're tired, when they're overworked. And the tragic death of, of Dr. Lauren Connolly was a prime example of the real horrific thing that can happen. So I do welcome the changes you're bringing forward in terms of staffing change, but it doesn't go far enough, and we do need to keep looking at this. Brian Whittle stressed the importance of making sure that those who look after our health have someone to look after theirs. We need to ensure that all staff in the health profession and social care profession get regular clinical supervision. I have noticed that that has started to slide. They need to be able to talk about where their mental health is and how they are coping with the pressures they actually incur. We need to ensure that our staff are fighting fit and able to pursue the work that they need to do. And I understand why Emma Harper is denying that the SNP have anything to do with what is going on in the NHS staffing um, levels. But I would remind her of what Miles Briggs pointed out, that the Cabinet Secretary at the time, Nicola Sturgeon, was warned when she made decisions about nursing places that it would have a longer-term effect. So I think it is slightly hypocritical to step away from it and say that the decisions made in the past have no impact on the present. I don't think... I don't think... We should use it as a political football. In fact, to be perfectly honest, as somebody who spent a long time, and you can cough all you like, because that's exactly what you're doing when you do that. 
As somebody who spent a lot of time in the NHS, I would be quite happy if government had nothing to do with the running of the NHS, quite frankly. That will never, ever happen because of the money around it. But it should be run by the people who know best. Don't, I'm in my last minute, seconds, in fact, I've got to sit Indeed down. Indeed you are, <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. So, I think we do need to focus on this. That is a crisis. Denying it doesn't solve the problem. We have to work together to solve it. Thank you very much. That concludes that debate.